Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to BOQ's Half Year Financial Results for 2018. My name is Tani Mangos and I'm the General Manager of Corporate Affairs and Investor Relations. Thank you for joining us today in the room, on the phones and via webcast. For today's presentation, Managing Director and CEO John Sutton will provide an overview of the result. Chief Financial Officer Anthony Rose will, take, will run through the numbers and then John will return to discuss the external environment, our strategic priorities and the outlook for the period ahead. This will be followed by the opportunity for analysts and investors to ask questions. I'll now hand over to John. Thank you, Tani. Well, good morning. I'd like to begin with the highlights of the result. Our strategy to grow the right way, together with our deliberate approach of building our niche businesses, is delivering. We have proactively sought to diversify our lending across the group over the past five years and we're seeing good results. I'm pleased to report that lending growth has improved. This was supported by our commercial niche segments as well as home loan growth through Virgin Money, BOQ Specialist and BOQ Broker Channels. Both Retail Bank and BOQ Business are delivering against the group's four pillar strategy. This half we've introduced a new segment reporting structure to align with the way we manage the business day to day. More detail are provided as we go through the presentation. On asset quality, remains sound, which is evident across a range of metrics. We are not seeing any areas of concern arise across the portfolio. We've maintained discipline in expense management. This has allowed us to continue investing for the future. Our capital position remains very strong providing us with options to enhance shareholder returns for the long term. These results were achieved against a backdrop of changing regulatory and marketing market conditions. Today we've also announced the sale of our St Andrews business and Anthony will provide some detail on the transaction in his section. Looking at the key financial elements of the result. Cash earnings after tax of $182 million increased 4% on first half 17. Earnings per share of 46.5 cents. This represents an increase of 2% on first half 17. Return on equity increased 10 basis points to 9.9%. The ordinary dividend has been maintained at 38 cents per share. Slide 6 provides an overview of the drivers of these results. Total lending growth of 671 million in this half represents an uplift of more than 800 million compared to the contraction of 157 million in the first half of 2017. Net interest margin increased one basis point from last half to 1.97% against a backdrop of intensified price competition for lending and deposits. Our cost to income ratio was 47.6% with operating expense growth of just $1 million on the prior half. Our loan impairment expense decreased $5 million or 19% compared to the same period in 2017. Moving to slide 7. We are seeing improvements in both housing and commercial loan growth. In housing, BOQ Broker, Virgin Money Australia and BOQ Specialist have all made strong contributions. We've also seen an improvement in the branch network as branch numbers stabilise. As we have previously stated, it will take more time for the branch network to return to lending growth. Our niche segments have delivered very good results, supporting commercial loan growth of 1.6 times system. The first half has traditionally been a slower growth period and we are pleased with the steady rate of growth since the prior corresponding period. Turning to our retail bank and BOQ business divisions. Retail banking has continued to diversify its channels. BOQ Broker and Virgin Money Australia contributed 40% of retail's home loan settlements in the first half of 2018. Overall, housing loan settlements increased 19% compared to the same time last year. This was achieved while continuing to fulfil our responsible lending obligations to our customers. Virgin Money continues to perform ahead of expectations. Since the launch of the Virgin Home Loan product just under two years ago, 
the portfolio has grown to $1.2 billion. Even though it'll take some time before our branch network returns to growth in lending, we've seen continued improvement through the network during this half. Our branch network remains a key driver for deposit gathering and is crucial in funding BAQ's future growth aspirations. Pleasingly, transaction account deposit growth has been strong at 10% since the first half of 17. The BAQ Business Division has continued to benefit from its maturing niche strategy across commercial customer segments. It achieved commercial loan growth of nearly $300 million. This has been delivered across target segments that seek a real relationship banking proposition and industry expertise. These include medical and dental, corporate healthcare, retirement living, hospitality and tourism and agribusiness. BAQ Specialist has delivered another strong period of housing loan growth. Total mortgage balances of this portfolio have grown to $4.1 billion in just three and a half years. BAQ Finance has remained focused on margin and mix and successfully grown its structured vendor finance programs. Our asset quality remains sound, which is clearly evident across a number of metrics. Impaired assets have reduced to 39 basis points of total loans. Impairment expense has remained steady at 10 basis points of total loans. Our arrears trends remain benign, with the exception of the usual post-Christmas uptick. In March, we've seen these levels reduce again. We've continued to search for and extract efficiencies across the business. This has enabled us to reduce core expenses by $4 million compared to last half. At the same time, we've been investing for the future with a large number of transformation initiatives underway across the group. We've completed the rollout of our new web experience platform, which enhances our customer connectivity. BAQ and BAQ Finance brands have now joined Virgin Money Australia and BAQ Specialist on the new platform. Since launch, we've seen positive feedback and engagement from customers. This is an important step in our journey to lift the standard of our digital assets to better meet our customers' expectations. There is still a lot more for us to do in this regard. Our internet and mobile banking offerings are high on the list to be refreshed into modern and more flexible platforms. Our capital levels remain very strong. Following the Basel and APRA papers released in the past few months, we remain comfortable with our position. Relative to our peers, we are in a very strong position as a standardised bank at 9.42% CET1. Our interim CET1 target of 9.25% remains in place until there is further certainty from the regulator. Therefore, our capital management options remain under active consideration. I'll now hand over to Anthony to discuss the financials in more detail. Thanks, John. <clears throat> I'll start with the uh, P&L on slide 14. I'll focus on comparisons with the first half 17, given the day count impact and seasonal factors mean that this is the most appropriate point of comparison. Total income increased by 3% or $18 million compared to the first half 17. The primary driver of this was net interest income growth of 5% or $23 million, uh, which is the result of growth in average interest earning assets of 2% and a six basis point increase in net interest margin. Non-interest income contracted $5 million or 6%, which I'll discuss later. Operating expenses increased $10 million or 4%, driven by an increase in software amortisation, as well as some seasonal timing differences between the periods, mainly around marketing activity. This meant underlying profit increased by $8 million or 3%. Loan impairment expense reduced by $5 million or 19%. Allowing for a tax rate of 31.4% due to the non-deductibility of interest on hybrid capital instruments, this meant that cash earnings increased 4% or $7 million. The comparisons with the second half of 2017 uh, are not as clear. The prior half included a $16 million benefit from the disposal of a vendor finance entity, which is obviously non-recurring in nature. Given this, 
we have uh, provided an adjusted column for a more like-for-like -like comparison. Even after adjusting for this, it's important to point out the impact of differential day count as well as general seasonality in our earnings between the first and second halves. Day count alone has an impact of $8 million or 2% on net interest income. The key takeaway is that we grew assets and did increase margin by one basis point compared to the prior half. So the result demonstrates an improved underlying position as we enter the second half. We also kept our operating and loan impairment expenses uh, largely stable, which further supports that the underlying trajectory is better than these numbers illustrate. Now moving on to business momentum, and I'll start with the loan portfolio on slide 15. We did achieve growth across all product portfolios. Total lending growth was 0.7 times system, with housing loan growth tracking at half system and commercial loan growth at 1.6 times system. Our strongest growth has been achieved in our niche commercial segments, as well as our new housing loan distribution channels. We've also continued to diversify the loan portfolio geographically, with Queensland exposure down to 45%. On slide 16, we provided an overview of our new reporting segments, which reflect the way we manage the business day to day. Retail banking incorporates housing loans and deposits originated through the branch network, direct channels, Virgin Money Australia and our mortgage broker distribution. This covers around $25 billion in lending assets and $17 billion in deposits. For clarity, it excludes home loans originated by BOQ specialists and also excludes SME loans that may have been originated through branches. Uh, these sit with BOQ Business, which also comprises BOQ branded commercial loans, as well as BOQ Specialist and BOQ Finance. This covers around $19 billion in lending assets and $13 billion in customer deposits, originated through our BOQ Business Relationship Managers, Finance Brokers and through BOQ Specialist. The third segment, Other, comprises our St Andrews insurance business, as well as a number of head office activities. Turning to the performance of the retail banking segment, specifically on slide 17, and the retail division's performance largely mirrors the group result in terms of the first half 17 comparison. Margin improvements supported income growth, while operating expenses increased due to higher software amortisation and some timing of spend mainly related to marketing activity. Loan impairment expense improved and the net result is a 4% increase in cash earnings to $75 million. The comparison with the second half 17 is hindered by day count and seasonal factors. Loan balances and margin were largely flat compared to the second half 17, while operating expense growth was contained to just 2%. There was an increase in loan impairment expense but this was from a very low base of just $3 million last half, which benefited from a $6 million reduction in collective provisions in the transition to the bank's new provisioning and reserving model that was implemented during the half. The retail division is delivering on its strategy of diversifying its origination channels and we are seeing good results in this regard. Virgin Money Australia and BOQ Broker Channels each contributed 20% of retail's settlement volumes. The branch network is still seeing runoff after a significant multi-year reduction in branch numbers, but this rate of runoff is slowing as branch numbers stabilise. Pleasingly, the branches have been very successful in growing relationship deposit balances, particularly transaction accounts, with the retail business delivering 10% growth in these balances from the first half 17. The retail team, led by Mac Baxby, is focused on enhancing our digital customer offerings while continuing to mature our new distribution channels and growing the Virgin product suite. <clears throat> Turning to BOQ Business on slide 19, and it may surprise some to see that it actually contributes a higher proportion of earnings than the retail division. <clears throat> Given the majority of its assets are 100% risk weighted though, we do allocate more capital to BOQ business than retail banking. Uh, given the stronger growth we see in commercial loans and BOQ specialist housing, there has been better top line growth in BOQ business. Expense growth has been managed in line with revenue growth, 
So underlying profit growth has been positive, particularly compared to the same period last year. Seasonality is particularly prevalent in commercial lending, with stronger asset growth and fee income typical in our second half relative to our first half. I'm not trying to provide guidance here, uh, but simply providing an observation on recent historical trends. The BAQ business strategy is very focused on growing in our target niche segments, including medical and dental through BAQ specialist, corporate healthcare and retirement living, hospitality and tourism, and agribusiness. The business has demonstrated good success in these segments in recent periods, delivering growth of $281 million in the first half 18. BOQ Specialist has been very strong in growing its housing loan book, although commercial loan growth has slowed as competitors become more aggressive in that market. We remain confident that the BOQ Specialist uh, business will be able to defend its strong market share position in the medical segment and con continue to grow its mortgage book by targeting professionals at the early stages of their career, which provides good pipeline of potential future commercial lending customers. BOQ Finance also traditionally sees slower growth in the first half compared to the second, but this business has been successful in growing its structured vendor programs, which do tend to be higher margin uh, than more commoditised equipment leasing. Overall, the BOQ business team led by Brendan White has also been successful at diversifying its portfolio geographically, with Queensland exposure down to just 37%. Moving to funding now on slide 21, and the story here is also one of diversification and improvement in mix. We've continued to build out our stable wholesale term funding sources while also focusing on improving our growth in stickier and better margin transaction deposits. This is where having a strong branch network is key and an area where our owner managers have excelled in recent periods. Getting into the detail of net interest margin on slide 22, and I'll point out that we have now moved in line with the rest of the industry in reporting our net interest margin net of offset accounts. This is an impact of around six basis points, which means our adjusted starting position from the second half 17 is 1.96%. We did deliver an improvement of one basis point over the half to 1.97%. Stepping through each of the moving parts here, and we saw a benefit of four basis points from asset repricing that was completed during 2017. This was fully offset though by the ongoing front to back book pricing dynamic we see in the market, which means that new business is written at rates lower than the average of the portfolio. This dynamic has increased in some parts of the book as competition for certain segments of home loans has intensified. This also included a mix related impact as the flow of higher spread interest only mortgage lending slowed down dramatically to 16% from 37% in the prior half. We did see a benefit from improved funding costs as the overall term deposit spreads improved compared to the prior period. This improvement was not as strong as we had hoped given spreads did widen for a couple of months throughout the middle part of the year, or the half, shall I say. Uh, there was also a benefit of two basis points from the reduction that has occurred in the three-month bank bills relative to the cash rate, which impacts the cost of our hedging, this element of the interest rate risk in our portfolio. The average cost of hedging reduced from 29 basis points in the second half of 17 to 23 basis points in the first half of 18. This trend has reversed recently, and I'll cover this in the outlook. Our NIM was reduced by one basis point due to the lower yield on our $4.2 billion capital and low cost deposit replicating portfolio. With the increased mix of business being originated through third parties, as well as an increase in payments to owner managers due to strong performance against their balance scorecard, largely related to deposit gathering, the third party cost component decreased NIM by one basis point. In terms of the outlook, uh, it's always very difficult to forecast margin, but I can take you through some of the moving parts as we see them. We've not made any significant asset pricing changes since August 2017, so there are no benefits coming through for this element as we sit here today. The front to back book pricing dynamic is ongoing, so we would expect a headwind of around five basis points in the second half from this element. 
Funding costs can go either way, depending upon competition and market conditions. But at this stage, on balance, we could see a reasonable benefit in the second half if rates stay consistent with where they are at the moment. Capital and low cost deposits will continue to be a drag of around a half a basis point in the second half if current rates implied by the forward curve prevail. We don't expect there to be any impact from third party costs. The final element is hedging costs, which is looking like it will become a headwind in the periods ahead if current bank bill rates are sustained. This could hit margin by between five to seven basis points over the next two periods with a drag of three basis points likely in the second half of 2018 if rates remain at current levels. This is a theoretical analysis, as, part of, as this part of the yield curve has recently been quite volatile. We have been sheltered from most of this impact to this point through the term hedging strategy that we employ. As always, industry pricing levels and general market conditions can impact product rates achieved on both assets and liabilities. It's difficult to provide clear guidance on the likely NIM outcome. But it's fair to say that the various moving parts are larger than they've been more recently and the outlook is less certain. To give some perspective, our underlying NIM for the month of March was a couple of basis points higher than the first half 18 level, largely due to improved term deposit spreads. Moving to uh, non-interest income on slide 23. As we've been saying for a number of periods, non-interest income is a very challenging line to grow and we've had to work very hard to, keep, uh, e to even keep this line flat. That has been evident in this half with a $5 million reduction. Banking fees continue to face pressure and we see limited opportunities to generate trading income or other fee income. Given this and the outlook for the second half, $75 million would be our expectation of a good result. That's before the impact of St Andrew's disposal and I'll discuss that later. Operating expenses have been closely managed. We continue to work on identifying opportunities to digitise and find efficiencies across the business. We must do this in order to provide the headroom for investments we need to, make, uh, to set the business up for the future. We have a number of strategic transformation projects in, project, in progress, but also a number of mandatory regulatory or maintenance projects that simply must be done. Uh, absolutely key to our success will be delivering our transformation program. However, we remain conscious of, of managing cost growth in light of the revenue growth profile. Turning now to asset quality, and there's no doubt that our loan book is in very good shape. Loan impairment expense of 10 basis points and impaired assets of $173 million or 39 basis points of gross loans are great numbers for the portfolio mix we have and given the journey we've been on since 2012. Uh, of course, current economic conditions also play a role with low interest rates, low unemployment, property price increases and reasonable levels of business confidence all contributing to a lower rears uh, and impairment results across the industry. We've also maintained strong provisioning coverage levels given the improvements in the underlying portfolio trends. We've been able to reduce absolute provisions but our coverage ratios have remained consistent. Arrears levels have remained benign. We've seen the usual seasonal increase in the post-Christmas period but this has generally been at or below uh, prior period levels. Uh, the spike that is most evident in the BOQ Finance portfolio in the 30-day arrears bucket, I'm pleased to say, has improved since the end of February and is now back to the low to mid-60s. Turning to capital on slide 28, and there are a number of moving parts to discuss this half. Firstly, we have the capital management initiatives announced at the full year 17 results, namely the $0.08 cent special dividend and a DRP suspension. These initiatives reduced common equity tier one by 29 basis points. Uh, as we also flagged at the last result, we expected benefits to come through due to the implementation of APS 120 and a reduction in our general reserve for credit losses. The former involving a reduction in risk weights on some of our housing loans that were previously risk weighted at 100% contributed 18 basis points to common equity tier one. The reduction in the GRCL following the implementation of our new collective provisioning model, added a further eight basis points to CET1. 
We did see a reduction of five basis points relating to a lower proportion of capital relief qualifying securitisation that is funding the mortgage portfolio. The net outcome of this was a common equity tier one ratio of 9.42%. This remains well above our interim target of 9.25%. With the recent APRA consultation paper on the risk weighting framework released and more water to still go under the bridge, we feel that we are in a very strong position. As such, we continue to consider the best way to deploy excess capital to deliver enhanced shareholder returns into the future. Today, we've also announced the sale of our St Andrews uh, insurance business to Freedom Insurance Group. BOQ acquired St Andrews in 2010, and since that time, it has made a very strong contribution to the group. In recent years, however, the business and industry dynamics have changed dramatically to a point where we believe Freedom is better placed to support St Andrews' future aspirations. This will also ensure BOQ can continue to deliver the best product solutions for our customers. Subject to completion adjustments, the profit on sale will be approximately $8 million. The sale will improve BOQ's common equity tier one ratio position uh, by approximately 20 basis points once the sale is completed. Uh, going forward, the absence of St Andrews will reduce non-interest income and expenses. In FY17, St Andrews contributed $20 million to non-interest income and $8 million to operating expenses with an after-tax contribution of $8 million. Uh, with that, I will hand back to John. Well, thank you, Anthony. As I turn to the outlook, it makes sense to consider the external environment we're operating in. With increased regulatory and public scrutiny of the banking sector, there is no doubt that conduct and trust remain a core focus for the industry. At BAQ, we're very aware of these challenges. We've worked hard and will continue to work hard to look after our customers and to ensure their needs are met and respected. There has been a heavy load of regulatory change with 57 external inquiries or reviews at a federal level since 2007. BAQ has been and will continue to be an active participant in these processes. Together with a number of regional banks, we've also been calling for competitive neutrality. We expect there will be structural changes to the industry as a result of this scrutiny. However, we encourage regulators to consider how any changes could unintentionally impact the competitive landscape of the sector. In terms of the economy, we remain cautiously optimistic. Although credit growth has been slowing, the other macro indicators are mostly heading in the right direction. There are signs of improvement in Queensland and Western Australian economies, with New South Wales, Victoria continue to perform well. In regional Queensland, the unemployment rate has declined in Mackay, Toowoomba and Townsville. The participation rate has risen across most regions as a sign that workers are becoming more confident about getting a job. Over the past year, stronger business conditions are being reported across all sectors. This combination of strong residential activity and the infrastructure boom has boosted the construction industry. Although system growth for commercial lending has been slower, we continue to find good opportunities in our niche segments, which tend to be in higher growth sectors of the economy. In this environment, our long-term strategy remains the right one. We are building out our business bank and opening up new retail channels. We remain focused on improving user experience in our digital offering. To do this, we're upgrading our online platforms and partnering with fintechs to deliver better solutions for our customers. We will expand our product offering with a focus on increasing deposit gathering. This includes the rollout of an improved merchant capability and the launch of our partnership with a digital payments provider. These two products will make it easier for our SME customers to receive payments. One of the key transformation projects we are commencing in the second half is moving our technology infrastructure into a modern cloud environment. This will improve the speed of project delivery and reduce costs. There are also a number of initiatives underway across the group that will bring us closer to our customers and enable us to provide them with a differentiated service offering. In summary, since 2012, 
BAQ has consciously evolved. In the retail space, we've gone from being a monoline distribution business to a diversified, multi-channel retail bank. On the commercial side, we are now a niche specialist business bank with a focus on higher growth sectors of the economy. Across the group, we've also expanded our geographical reach and have a national presence. Underpinning this expansion is our commitment to growing the right way. Meeting our responsible lending obligations remains core to our operating model. Our niche segment strategy is delivering in an ever-changing operating environment. We're getting back to a steady state rate of growth with very solid results in our business bank. Virgin Money continues to exceed our expectations. We firmly believe this business will become a significant contributor to the overall group in the future. We anticipate there will be structural changes in the industry given the issues that are emerging from the Royal Commission. We believe competition and stability must coexist. For the past decade, the default regulatory position has been focused on safety and stability. This has contributed to the emergence and maintenance of a concentrated market structure in retail banking. We have been advocating for regulatory settings to better balance the needs of both stability and competition. Maintaining discipline of how we invest and spend remains a priority. Given the pace of change, this is essential so we can continue to invest for the future with strong focus on improving customer experience. Our capital levels position us favourably to many others in the industry. This provides us with the flexibility to consider options to utilise excess capital in a way that will enhance shareholder returns. Finally, we are well positioned to deliver on our core strategic priorities over the medium to long term. Thank you for your time and now I'll hand back to Tani to moderate Q&A. Thank you, John. We'll be taking questions from analysts and investors only. Can I please ask that you limit your questions to two only? For those in the room, please wait for the microphone, state your name and organisation you represent. So we'll begin um, in the room first. Thank you. It's uh, Andrew Triggs from JP Morgan. Uh, just to follow up on the, the cost investment side of things, um, there was a reasonable cost investment flagged last half, and I, I note, Anthony, in your comments, you mentioned that it will follow the, the revenue growth trajectory. But just in terms of the areas that you called out as re requiring critical spend, like the in, uh, internet and mobile banking space, just what extent of, of capital do you think is necessary there? And how much will we, excuse me, capitalise versus expense, do you think, in the, next, in the coming periods? Um, so the... Uh, what, what we've guided to is we've been uh, spending approximately uh, 50 to $60 million of uh, capitalised spend per annum and, and our amortisation charge is effectively growing into that, that profile. Um, we did talk about at the full year results uh, the fact that we one of the things under active consideration which we thought was uh, warranted sharing at the time we announced the capital initiatives uh, was looking at... Um, is there a way to deploy some of that capital in a fungibility sense into an acceleration of that program? That is still firmly on the table with similar guidance to what we've provided. Um, John did mention about the, uh, the significant infrastructure transformation program that we've got in place. Um, we'd probably like to see a little bit more of that roll out before we fully commit to, um, to that uh, capacity to deliver. I think for us, the message is the same as what we delivered uh, at the last half. You know, we have a high CET1 that gives us a high degree of optionality. Uh, if you look at our results over this last half, we are delivering on our long-term strategic priorities, particularly around how we're growing virgin money, particularly how we're growing BAQ specialist, uh, BAQ finance as well. And uh, there are a number of options available to us. So it can be you know, cap you know, capital management, uh, further investment, uh, or it could be a combination thereof. So we actually have that under active consideration. The one thing I will say is it probably not quite clear as what we thought it may have been uh, last half is where APRA will go with the Basel rules in terms of uh, local harmonisation. So if there is any significant change, of course, we'll come back to the market. But we are in an enviable position to be able to prosecute further uh, what we may want to do around our uh, uh, further investment 
or uh, shareholder returns. Uh, next to Andrew. Uh, John Mott from UBS. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the Royal Commission join the Productivity Commission in suggesting that broker fees um, go to a flat fee structure and potentially even being paid for by the customer rather than the bank. If this eventuates, do you need to reinvest in distribution, um, especially outside Queensland? And also, secondly, this also follows on from Sedgwick. Um, they're sort of recommending uh, changes that the banks will adopt as well. If that happens, what would happen to your owner-managed branch contracts and would you need to renegotiate those contracts? So there's two parts of those questions. You've uh, cut your questions down a little bit, normally six-part, but uh, <laughs> uh, just dealing with the first one, uh, brokers play a critical role in the Australian financial landscape and they have done so for many, many, many years. And uh, we fully support uh, the, the, the broker business because customers choose. They, they choose to go to brokers. They choose to deal with brokers and uh, they trust brokers. Uh, and we've seen the fruits of that over the, last, uh, over the last six months or the last 12 months, particularly with when you think about Virgin. It's, it's a, it's a broker-led business at the moment. Uh, if you think about BAQ, uh, again, broker-led. So I don't see the broking industry disappearing um, will there be change in how brokers are remunerated or, or that may be a possibility and I'm sure that the industry will need to work through that. And I think what is really important is before we jump to any conclusions is to really see what is the outcome from uh, the Royal Commission and then again what is the legislative uh, outcome or reform if any. But at BAQ we fully support the broker industry. In terms of, um, in terms of the branch numbers, uh, and commission structure. We run a balanced scorecard. Uh, we've had that in place for for a period of time, and a number of uh, the vast majority of our owner managers have moved to that balanced scorecard. It's it's product agnostic, uh, particularly uh, you know where there's a real focus uh, around ensuring that we've got the customer outcomes right. So whether it's deposits or it's the loan product, or whether it's just meeting those customer needs. So I don't anticipate us having to radically overhaul. Uh, our uh, balanced scorecard with, with our broker network, with our uh, owner manager network. Victor, next to John. Thank you. Um, two questions from, from me one on uh, margins, one on balance sheet, if possible. Um, so, on margins, um, we um, seen, um, particularly in, in, in light of the fact that obviously Bank of Queensland doesn't have to pay uh, the levy that major banks have to pay. Um, the, the trends, the underlying trends excluding the levy looks like they're a little bit weaker than what the feedback from, from other players suggest. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, to what extent perhaps that was impacted by the fact that you had to improve your NSFI. I've noticed that your NSFI now is at 111, which is presumably a more comfortable level. Uh, and to what extent as we go into the next period, you would expect your margin performance to be uh, more align or slightly better than peers. I uh, appreciate there is some movement around BBSW or OIS spreads and, and excluding that element. Um, are you more comfortable that your margin trends should improve? And on balance sheet, uh, um, you know, you, I think, John, you, you talked uh, about uh, your more conservative lending standards in the past leading to underperformance on, on your ability to grow mortgages. It feels like the industry has rebased to some extent and, and everyone is becoming a lot, a lot or quite, quite a lot more conservative. Um, to what extent do you think that would be a potential less impediment for you going forward and, and to what extent you, do you think you'd be able to come back to market in terms of your volume growth? That's something that uh, both Anthony and I have been talking about uh, for a considerable period of time and we have often spoken about uh, the case study that we, where we could only lend 800,000 and another bank was lending close to 1.3 million. What is really, really clear, really clear out of uh, some of the submissions at the RC over the last few weeks is that a lot of the major banks have been actually just using HEM. I want to reiterate again what BAQ does, and this will stand us in the long term for our customers. We validate 100% of our mortgages we ask the questions around expense and expense management for those households to ensure that they get the right loan. That's what needs to be done. And sure, I feel that over the last three or four halves, 
that has held back our loan growth. But what is really important about our loan growth at the moment is that we have virgin money that is attracting a materially different type of customer to the bank that complements the BAQ uh, customers that we have. Uh, we've got BAQ specialists in a short period of time have put $4.1 billion worth of mortgages. We are building back towards system growth. I actually feel that system growth will probably moderate as some of these changes go through and some of the larger banks actually have to implement um, th those changes. In terms of margin, big picture for us is to continue to execute on our strategy, particularly in our business bank. It's higher margin business and it's also customers that will we will fulfil more than just one need. We will actually fulfil it on a relationship need, whether it's foreign exchange or whether it's letters of credit or whether it's just uh, including the lending or whether it's what we're going to be introducing shortly on a payments platform as well. Uh, but Anthony can talk more to the moving parts on, uh, on NIM. Yeah, specifically to your question around the net stable funding ratio, I think uh, you know, the, the industry is on a pretty reasonable glide path to achieve the, the regulatory requirement, um, again with uh, understanding that we were in a, a transitional period to, to sort of achieve um, the full element of the buffers. I, I think there was probably a, an expectation uh, from the regulator that was slightly enhanced on that trajectory that, that did suggest you know, getting to the buffer position um, more quickly was, was probably the most prudent. Uh, there wasn't much that we needed to do over and above what we were already doing. But what it did mean uh, is we did see some more aggressive activity in the term deposit space, particularly in the middle market and negotiated space as well through that, through that period, which I think I called out in, in the margin discussion that, you know, sitting at the full year results six months ago, we probably, uh, you know, were expecting a, a little better outcome on the liability spreads um, coming through in this margin result than, than actually was achieved and, and that I think was the largest contributing um, difference between where we are now to, uh, to what we might have thought back then. Um, good morning, it's Andre Stadnik from Morgan Stanley. Just wanted to ask a couple of questions, one on, um, one on the margin and one on just overall um, a competitive environment. Just on the margin, um, I noticed that interest only percent of a total book uh, fell quite rapidly from 37% to 32%, uh, half and half. So could you comment a little bit about um, you know, the switching we're seeing in the back book? I think the, uh, um, the issue with uh, interest only is that you know, all, all the banks have had uh, the regulatory change. The one thing I'll say about interest only, again, is where, where, where we have been for a long period of time is we made sure that any customer that walks through the door that wants an interest-only home loan, that they can actually afford to pay it on a P&I basis. And our testing was done on a P&I basis and we did validate their expenses all the way through. So of course, uh, probably the market has come back in terms of a P&I basis and that's what the regulator wants. But there's a lot of commentary out there about what happens when customers um, move from interest only to P&I and, uh, uh, you know, I'm confident that we've had the right settings in the assessment of interest only uh, for when those customers do move back to uh, P&I. Um, so, look, I think we, the, the switching that we've seen hasn't been uh, overly pronounced um, in that. I think we've just seen a, a significant drop in flow. I mean, we've had some months where... Uh, broker flows in interest only have been high single digits. Um, and, and I think it illustrates the point that, that John's highlighted. Uh, it appears that the totality of the industry suddenly moved to p and servicing very, very, you know, at, at a point in time. Um, th that is, I think, the only explanation that can get you from a 35% flow down to a 15% flow across the sector. Um, more so than... Yeah, pricing differential obviously then plays a part, but you know, if you were getting a larger loan size because you were being assessed on interest only, you might have been prepared to pay the extra points for it. Um, and, and when that suddenly goes away and you're getting the same loan size, do you want to pay the higher rate when, you know, the proposition's not the same for the customer or the broker for that matter? So, so it, sounds, it sounds like the switch in, um, in the back book uh, slowed down towards the end of the half. Is that fair to say? I think there's been a general slowdown in... Uh, in activity in refinance across the sector. And I think a lot of that is 
that it, you can't just walk across the road to a, to a branch and, and fill out a one-page form and, and you're, you're done within 24 hours. It is provide your bank statements, provide your details. You, you've got to prove now in a way that clearly other institutions weren't weren't uh, weren't doing. So that that's I think provided a natural disincentive for customers to, to look at refinancing because it's harder to do so than it was. And then you've also got that question around what's maximum loan size now that they might have been able to get relative to where the old settings were and, and there's that sort of incentive piece that, that's moved away. Sorry, and, and the second one about um, just competitive uh, outlook. You know, uh, outside of changes to risk weights, you know, what do you think the Productivity Commission review or any of the other reviews can deliver in terms of enhancing the competitive stance of BQ and, you know, and other regional banks? Well, the Regional Bank Coalition has worked together over a number of years and we did put in a very strong uh, submission to the Productivity Commission and I must say that the feedback from the PC has been really, really good. And again, I do sound like a broken record and um, forgive me if I do sound that way. But again, if you, think about, if you think about where we are at the moment and what we've seen over the last few weeks in terms of responsible lending, the big four banks enjoy a considerable advantage over regional banks, particularly those standardised versus advanced, that uh, have significantly lower risk weightings and therefore will uh, get much higher ROEs. But if you look at what the sort of behaviour that's going on, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. And uh, so we, we still advocate that there should be a narrowing of those risk weights between advanced and standardised. Uh, you've still got the too big to fail uh, benefit and uh, you know, it's all about that competitive neutrality that the regional banks uh, uh, are advocating and we're going to continue down that path. Uh, we also fundamentally believe in greater transparency for consumers when they're dealing with brokers. It's difficult for a, bro for a consumer to assess if they're getting a loan that is actually originated from a big four owned broker. Uh, again, those things all point to greater transparency for consumers and I, I think that's really good for the industry. So there's no doubt that there are a lot of reviews going on and, and really where these reviews come out at the end is probably sometime towards the end of this year and it really will require a what sort of legislative response or what the regulator's response will be to what falls out of the back of these inquiries. But we will continue to push our case for competitive neutrality. I might, I might add to that, John. Like I think the uh, the direction of the uh, of APRA's discussion paper on on risk weights is clearly positive around narrowing that gap between advanced and standardised framework. Um, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge in in the formulation of the final rules there. So we you know, have to remain conservative until that emerges. But but that is that is positive, um, and we do and we've been questioning for some time. But what did emerge out of the Productivity Commission is it it does appear that um, the flows into broker owned businesses of proprietary product are, are well above natural market share, which simply pose an obvious question, um, and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to want to understand um, that, you know, that, that it is a level playing field and, and customers have been, you know, dealt with appropriately um, to ensure they are in the right product. Any other questions in the room? Here to my left. Hi, it's Anthony Hu uh, from Deutsche Bank. Uh, question on your uh, proprietary channel. Um, you said the branch rationalisation process is largely behind us. Um, you've said volume growth. Uh, it takes some time to, for that to get to a um, positive number. Um, just running based on you know, current pipeline, how far away do you think that is? Yeah, look, I, I said uh, last half that it'll be a while before we get back to total system growth, and there are a lot of moving parts with system growth at the moment. Uh, what I think is really important too is that we just don't just focus on what the branch does at an asset side. It is really important that we actually have the branches looking at both sides of the balance sheet in terms of lending on the asset side and meeting the customer needs, which is really important. And as you will have seen through these results, particularly with Virgin Money, $1.2 billion worth of uh, you know, home loan assets in a very short period of time, BOQ specialist at 4.1 over, you know, over a very short period of time over the last few years, uh, and what we're doing in the commercial bank, uh, we still need to continue to raise deposits to fund these initiatives. 
our owner managers have not been immune to all these changes that have gone on in the external market, particularly around uh, uh, what other banks have been doing in terms of uh, how they assess lending, but they are responding uh, in a way that looks after the needs of the customer and looks at the looks at the total needs of the customer, which includes liabilities. We're really happy that we've um, that the branch numbers have stabilised. We've got a good pipeline of new owner managers that are coming through. In fact, some of the newer ones that have arrived have uh, you know, had some very, very good success as well. So we're very committed to the network, uh, but we're doing it in a balanced way. It's, you know, it's, it's about the customer, making sure we serve those customer needs. It will take us time to get back to system growth, but there are a lot of forces out there at the moment, and I feel that uh, particularly around responsible lending, when, the, when, when you see the big four uh, basically just using HEM as a measure, that that will start to come back towards us and, and assist us over time. Question um, behind this gentleman. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Brett LaMessure from Shores. A couple of questions. You said uh, that your business bank loans have higher margins than, the, uh, than your home loans. Can you tell us what the average gap is, the, the average benefit that you get from business loan margins relative to home loans? Obviously, they come with higher risk weighting as well. And, and uh, so, look, on, a, on an adjusted basis, the, uh, the, marg the, the margin to risk weighting adjusted is slightly lower in our, in our business bank than it is in our, in our retail portfolio. That, that probably moves depending upon how market dynamics and pricing changes occur across the sector from, from time to time. That's just where it is at, at the moment. Uh, but it is, in an absolute um, sense, high, higher margin uh, business. Yep. And uh, on your comments you made about the, the net interest margin in March being a couple of points higher than uh, the first half and attributed that to TDs, is that uh, related to a block of TDs maturing, more expensive TDs, such that that benefit is unlikely to continue or recur uh, for the rest of the half, or is it a recurring benefit, do you think? So the... Uh the, we, we attributed that, that two basis points, and I think in the, in the discussion I, I did say we, we could expect a, a reasonable uh, benefit from the, the liability side if current conditions prevailed. Um, now, that's, that's a very big if because of where basis is at the moment, and that's throwing around spreads on both the asset and the liability side quite dramatically, depending upon, I don't want to get too technical, which parts of the curve you're actually looking at. Um, so it is hard to provide that guidance. But if you look at our current new business spreads on TDs today relative to our historic average portfolio, what's being written today currently is lower than the price at which is rolling off. And that is expected to continue if we weren't to see any change in pricing. But that's a very big if again. Well, again, I think on you know the long term strategy for us is to continue to work very hard at gathering low cost deposits, and uh, also we've you know invested heavily into some of our data analytics capability around managing our TD portfolio on a much better basis as well. Okay, one more from the floor before we go to the phones. Uh, good morning, Richard Wiles, Morgan Stanley, uh, Anthony. I've got a question on capital. Uh, the APRA discussion paper proposes higher risk weightings on high risk loans. Uh, you look like you have about 50% of your loan portfolio that is either investor and or interest only. Uh, so just a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, have you um, done any preliminary modelling on what your risk weightings might be under the proposed measures? And secondly, uh, do you think your risk weightings as a standard bank are likely to go up or down? Uh, on the mortgage portfolio as a result of that discussion paper? Um, so the first answer is yes, we've done some modelling. To be fair, that modelling is based upon clearly an incomplete assumption set. So we're not confident that the assumptions we've put in are actually going to be the outcomes. So it would be preliminary for us to actually provide any, any of that. I think we're very confident with where we are um, positioned. Sorry, the second part to your question. So do you think the risk weightings on your mortgage portfolio will go up or down as a standard bank? <sighs> Clearly you're hoping that the gap to 
the majors narrows, yep. um, but in absolute terms, Look, up or down. Th this is complicated by the overarching statement in the discussion paper that effectively says we will have a recalibration of standardised and advanced risk weights in our local jurisdiction. And then after that is all complete, um, there will be a consideration of a recalibration of the, and I'll simplify this, a 10.5% target for a DCIB advanced bank and an 8.5% target for a standardised bank. So there's a big recalibration question that nobody really knows what that answer is, other than uh, the regulator, I think, has made it clear that uh, on average, if you are a standardised, if you are an advanced DCIB bank and you're holding 10.5% of capital, you're probably in the right spot. And there might be some winners and some losers in that. Likewise, if you're a regional uh, standardised bank holding 8.5%, you're holding an adequate amount of capital. So, I, unfortunately, to give you anything more than that would be based upon an incomplete understanding on our, on our part. Um, but we are very comfortable with 9.42%. OK, we've got some questions on the phone. Your first question comes from the line of Frank Padrug of Merrill Lynch. Please ask your question. Good morning. Two questions from me. The first is, given significant changes to your book mix in recent years, history is probably no longer a useful guide when estimating loss rates, and indeed we've seen another strong performance this year. So what's the internal thinking around both mid and peak cycle loss rates in the new cleaner BOQ? And secondly, if I could just pick up on the interest-only discussion. So clearly you and all the banks have got below 30 quite easily, which has included some repricing. What have you learned about consumer behaviour in the process, including resilience of the consumer? Well, I'll deal with the resilience of the consumer, and I come back to the point, and I'm sorry if I sound uh, that I'm repeating myself, but it, it, it is that we looked at our interest-only loans and assessed them on P&I and uh, made sure that we had the conversation. What, what we are starting to probably see is that the investor overall, the housing investor, um, those that appetite is moderating in the market and uh, probably, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of press about it, quite a lot of media about it, and it feels as if the home loan investor is probably keeping their hand in their pocket at the time being, given a moderation in house prices in some of the capital, um, in the capital cities. In, in terms of loss rates through the cycle, um, we, we're very comfortable with the uh, risk practices that we actually have uh, within the BAQ group. Uh, and again, uh, how our book will perform against others is largely going to be dependent on the policies and processes that we've adopted over the last few years. And again, it's that conversation, particularly in retail around customers, uh, their living expenses, uh, stress testing their ability to pay loans at a higher rate, uh, which will really have a large impact on how banks perform uh, through the cycle. Uh, also, you know, from our perspective, it, it's the economy is still ticking along nicely. It's still doing really well. Unemployment rates are really low. Uh, absolute rates are still are, are at all-time lows. So uh, do we see on the horizon a significant uptick in losses or arrears? No. Uh, and in the in the commercial bank, uh, in the business bank, again, it's sticking to our netting around the customers that we bank in the niches that we've chosen to be in. If you look at um, BAQ Finance, the, the levels of losses that we actually have are nowhere near what you'd see through the cycle on a... On, on that style of business. So uh, we're comfortable where we sit at the moment. That, that's probably the one portfolio that um, yeah, is uh, yeah, right, right at the edge of, of expectations uh, on a through the cycle or a more mid-cycle perspective. Um, you'd, you'd expect uh, a much higher loss yeah. experience for the nature of the, of the activity that we've, we've got there. I think we've called that out for some time, mm. that we wouldn't believe that's yeah. sustainable. That being said, again, um, the, the evidence on arrears rates, which are a really good leading indicator in that portfolio, um, continue to suggest uh, you know, it, it won't be returning to mid-cycle 
um, in the short term, um, which, which is positive. Thanks, Raj. We'll take another call. Your next question comes from the line of Ashley Dalzell of Goldman Sachs. Please ask your question. Thanks, and morning, guys. I just had one question on the margin. Just in your front book, pricing and mix category, sort of suggesting that if the current mortgage pricing environment holds, that will be another five bip or so headwind in the second half. Can I just ask how you're thinking about that uh, more broadly into FY19? Again, if the sort of current mortgage pricing environment holds and consists, and you know, cognizant of the fact that by then you'll probably be a little past the hump in some of these interest-only um, changes through the market, um, can we expect that headwind to reduce sort of meaningfully into 19, or does that look pretty locked at around four or five pips per half for, for the foreseeable future? We don't make any comment about directions of mortgage pricing. Um, what we will do, though, is come back to where our long to medium term strategy is, and that is to continue to uh, work both sides of the balance sheet, particularly on the on the liability side. Low cost deposits. Every time you increase your low cost deposits, it does help with net interest margin. Uh, we are actively managing our TD portfolio. Our Treasury team did a fantastic job this year in wholesale markets, taking advantage of some of those cheaper rates in wholesale markets towards the end of last year and early into this year. Uh, again, in terms of business mix, um, the business bank on an absolute level, not on a risk-adjusted level, but an absolute level does get higher margin business and we'll continue to pursue that. Uh, but again, you know, there's the ebbs and flows of what you see in a competitive marketplace on the mortgage on mortgage pricing and we're not making any uh, prediction or comment about the future direction. The, the, probably the, the other colour I'd, I'd add to that is it, it does, if you were to assume uh, margins across the sector to be relatively stable or, or take it a step below that, that interest spreads on mortgages remained relatively stable, uh, you know, there's, um, that, that would suggest a continuation of, of recent repricing activity that's occurred in the market. So, and, and if that situation continues, that, that sort of four to five basis points type profile would likely continue. Um, if we were to see a change in that dynamic, obviously, you know, that, that's when that would, that would change. OK, thank you, guys. And now to um, a final question on the phone. Our last question from the phone comes from the line of Azib Khan of Morgan's Financial. Please ask your question. For the, for the standardised banks. Sorry, is it, will be, do, you want to, do you want to start again, please? Sorry, we, yep, we just sure. missed the start of your question. Yeah, sure, sure. Look, look, Anthony, you mentioned a couple of times that you think the unquestionably strong benchmark for standardised banks will effectively be 8.5%, and, and I agree that sounds, that sounds right. However, however, your interim target continues to be 9.25%. I'd just like to understand why, why is there so much conservatism in there. It's also sounding like... It does sound like your initial modelling suggests that your total credit, rate, total credit risk weighted assets will fall in light of APRA's February paper... Um, so is, 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 is part of the conservatism because you're allowing for the possibility maybe that if your risk weighted assets do fall, your benchmark may be increased to above 8.5? 8, 8 <clears throat> that, that, that's clearly uh, a potential outcome. Um, and until we get the clarity, um, we, we think it's sensible to be conservative um, in our settings. It is, it is possible, though, that your benchmark will remain unchanged. Do you agree? I think it's... As if it's John here, I think it's it's too early to say. I mean, Anthony's you know explained it has explained it well. There are a lot of moving parts yet, and we we still ha we don't have quite have the clarity from what APRA will want to do around standardised versus advanced with uh, Basel three, and we'll continue to do our modelling, and uh, you know we will hopefully when we come back for the next set of results that we'll you know we'll have a much more clearer picture of where we'll uh, end up. So on that basis, we're comfortable to have the 9.25 as, as the target rate for the time being. Sure, 
Sure. So just just another question then. So even with that 9.25% in place, I mean, your ratio at the moment is sitting comfortably above that. Even if we allow for up to 10 bips to be chewed up with any acceleration of investment spend at some point, it's still looking quite comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, if your risk weighted assets do reduce going forward, that, that, that adds to the strength. You've got another 20 bips adding coming, coming to add to the ratio with the sale of St Andrews. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of fat there in terms of set one. Why the decision to not, not announce a special dividend today? Well, the first thing that's really clear is that uh, the St Andrews sale has only just been announced and there's probably going to take six to nine months for, for regulatory approval for the deal to uh, conclude. And I think that we've been uh, fairly clear on uh, what we would do or what the, the different options that we actually have around our capital and where they are under active consideration and uh, you know we'll, we'll keep the market posted accordingly. Just one more question from me on that. If you, if you, if you, if you are keen on keeping your set one close to 9.5% going forward, no, 9 will you consider paying... Will you consider paying just special dividends and operating a 1.5% discount to DRP uh, uh, just to maximise distribution of franking credit? Our target is 9.25 and it would be really yeah. inappropriate of me to forecast what we may or may not do with, uh, with dividends. Uh, and, and we'll leave it as what we've said uh, consistently last half and this half, that having our uh, CET1 at 9.42 gives us a considerable degree of optionality to either grow risk-weighted assets, continue to invest in our business, or to undertake further capital initiatives or a combination thereof, and uh, we're very happy at the position we have at the moment. And just maybe <clears throat> on your specific point um, on, under, on the franking credit distribution point, I think the, uh, the capital management initiative, the special dividend the full year last year, um, demonstrated that you know, we are conscious that liberating those franking credits um, you know, is valuable to a a large number of our investor base um, and uh, and obviously that would be a significant part of consideration of, of any future initiative going forward. Okay, we've got one um, time for just one more question from the room. Just trying to think. Thanks. It's uh, Ed Henning from CLSA. Two hopefully quick ones for me so we can wrap it up. Just on the, the cost base, you continue to talk about managing your costs. Obviously a lot of revenue pressure there, but can you actually, if the environment gets worse um, with amortisation charge increasing, um, have a cost go negative? Growth, that is. And just on the second, and just on the second one, um, you grew your term funding during the period, your wholesale funding. Have you got a, have you got a buffer there, or do you need to still continue to grow that? Uh, so on, on on the first one, um, look, you, you, you're talking in the hypotheticals of. <clears throat> what does a completely different um, system outlook look like? Um, and, and obviously, you know, each business needs to adjust its settings to the prevailing environment that it's operating in. Um, I think what you'd be talking about would be you know, a, a reasonably significant diversion from probably the, the, uh, the consensus economic outlook um, at, at the moment um, for, for us to, to drive into that type of an outcome. Um, on the term funding space, we are in a good position, 111 on, on NSFR. I, I would say we're, we're in a BAU um, environment at, at the moment in that respect, and we're, we're probably at, at the right level. Um, and uh, but we'll obviously continue to, to look at um, uh, the stable wholesale funding sources as an important element of our overall um, growth profile. Okay, that um, brings an end to our briefing. Thank you very much for joining us.